Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. We've been going through um, looking at um, prophecies, Dead Sea Scrolls, a lot of interesting things on how to live your life, what they expected, things like that. And we started looking at the early church fathers again. Main idea is we look at scriptures and we see the prophecies and we guess, and I think pretty accurately, what they mean and what we've always been taught. And so if you go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls and they say basically the same thing, and then you go forward to the early church fathers that say basically the same thing, then you can see that the concept was clearly taught before, during, and after the time of the Messiah. So we have to have right doctrine. So if, some, if somehow a word meant one thing before the New Testament, something different in the New Testament, and then something different yet again with the early church fathers, and, and that's always possible, words change through the centuries. But when that happens, it's kind of weird. But it's really nice to look and see, no, this particular word didn't change at all. It means exactly the same thing. And we'll get a lot of that kind of strange stuff here in the near future. But let's go ahead and start our study today. We wanted to look at Irenaeus. And remember, we were talking last week about the different church fathers. Let me just bring that up. This is our book, The End Times by the Ancient Church Fathers. And if we go down here, there's a chart that we looked at. There we go. This one here. So let me... That's upside down. There we go. Let me back this up just a little. Okay, there we go. So in here, we've got Peter, Paul, John, and Mark as apostles, and then their disciples. And we talked about Clement of Rome actually studied under Peter, Paul, and John, told you a little bit about his history, and the fact that he wrote his memoirs and an epistle to, to Corinth, actually. So very interesting. Then we talked about John and his history, and his two main disciples were Polycarp and Ignatius. He had another disciple, Papias, but anyway. Long story, there's not a whole lot of his writings left. These two are interesting because Ignatius then writes seven epistles at least. And so in the apostolic era. So if your dad said, I know such and such is true because, let me turn my volume down here. I'm getting bing, dings. Um, if your dad said such and such a thing is true, I know because I had dinner with Paul and you know peter and james came to our church one time and i was able to ask them i've been taught this is that correct and they said oh absolutely so when you get testimony like that that's fantastic so we really want to pay attention to clement polycarp and ignatius Phantius, and Methides, basically because they're disciples of the apostles doesn't mean they can't be wrong they very well could be and i think we've seen some stuff we saw at least a scribal error in just in um, one of the guys last week, I think it was we were talking about. So we looked at these, and then Polycarp, of course, has two main disciples, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. They weren't taught directly under the apostles, but they were able, possibly Irenaeus, for instance, to double check, occasionally seeing them. And then he has two disciples, Hippolytus and Caius from Irenaeus. And so these others are you get further away and you get confused ideas. But that's our basic chart, and I would like to add to it. So let me go back to, I think it's, this is the right one. There we go, this one. And what we did last week is we looked at, with the introduction, you can see here, there was 6,000 years. And then we would basically look through all the quotes of the early church fathers that believed there would be 6,000 years of human history and a millennial reign. And then we found out a long time ago, we've been talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls for quite a while, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's the same system, but they have a complete calendar. So we know exactly what year we're at, uh, what's happening, that kind of stuff. It's, it's still impossible to set a date because even if you knew, for instance, the second coming was going to be in the year 6,000 and that was exactly so many years away, that's when the age changes. But that doesn't mean the second coming is that exact year. You know, the Bible talks about days being shortened. But it does help us put it in a timetable. There's no way, compared to the church fathers, 
the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the other things that the rapture of the tribulation period is 300 years away, or even 200 years away, which if we went by the current Jewish calendar, it'd be 215, something like that, years away, and not even close with the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. But this just showed us that, again, the same thing. If the Dead Sea Scrolls teach this, it's hinted at in scriptures, like where Peter quotes a day is like a thousand years, you know, a few things like that, just a hint. And then the church fathers say, no, no, that's exactly what's meant. You have a consistency through that. So that might have been surprising to some of you. The rest of the stuff, not so much. So we went through that, and then we looked at other people in the first century, and we talked about Papias. He basically said there's going to be a pre, you know, he's premillennial. There's a literal 1,000 year reign sometime in the future. And this he was taught directly by the Apostle John himself. So that's pretty interesting. And then we looked at this, the whole, the epistle of Barnabas saying that the Jews will come back and build a temple. And then there's going to be a millennial reign. So not a whole lot of detail, but we're just seeing that, yeah, that's pretty much what we believe also. And then we went down and we looked at Justin Martyr. Now, Justin Martyr is actually second century. But just looking when, in this particular book, when there's just a handful of things, we group them together real quick. So, for instance, if someone wrote, I don't know, five volumes, like Irenaeus wrote a five volume work against cults. So, figure 500 pages, you know, each book being 100 pages, something like that. Well, in that, if he talked about prophecy at all, it would be maybe just a few pages because the cult got some weird thing. And he does actually in there. There's a cult that said that they were the 144,000 back in the first century. Not the same people you're thinking of. but So he writes about that. You can't be because blah, blah, blah. Here's the interpretation. So, so most of these people will do that. Most of them will not talk about prophecy. And a few will. And out of the prophecy, a lot of them are just generalized, not a specific teaching on prophecy. So we're, it, it's really nice to have these kind of things. And so Justin Martyr talked about uh, the Antichrist coming is yet future. Uh, and of course, he's writing this in 165. So sometime after 165, the Antichrist comes. It's not Nero back in the first century. It's continuous. Then there's going to be a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. And then there's this uh, apostasy where the Antichrist attacks believers. So he's going to be anti-Christian, anti-Jewish. I think that's where we ended up. So now we want to look at Irenaeus. He has some interesting things. So his first, first quote here is from Against Heresies 535. Remember, he writes five books against the cults of his day. So talking about some cult. He happens to delve into prophecy and he says this, there's a resurrection of the just. So that tells us, number one, there's a resurrection of everybody, but there's a resurrection of the just at one time. And then some other time, there's a resurrection of everyone else. So there's at least two. And of course, we believe that too. We believe that the rapture resurrection will occur um, around the time of the tribulation period before, during or after depending if you're pre-mid or post-trib. But um, it happens then. And then at the end of the millennial reign, there's a great white throne judgment, totally separate resurrections. So he believes that too. There is a resurrection of the just that takes place after the destruction of the Antichrist and the nations under his rule. Many believers will make it through the tribulation and replenish the earth. In the resurrection, we will have fellowship and communion with the holy angels and a union with spiritual beings. Uh, the new heavens and new earth are first created, and then he goes on. Now, this is interesting here because if you look at this, um, there's a resurrection of the just that takes place after the um, destruction of the Antichrist. So that would make it post-trib, that resurrection. And many people have thought that there's a pre-trib resurrection rapture. And then there are the saints that die. And then the saints, you know, that make it out of the great tribulation rule and reign with Christ. Uh, along with uh, the church, according to Revelation 20. But then there's also people that actually survive through the tribulation that don't rule and reign with Christ. They're just 
people in the millennial reign. So that makes it seem like there's three or four separate groups. May or may not be true. That may or may not be what he's talking about. But I want us just to get over the, the general idea. So there's going to be a resurrection of the just separate from everyone else. There's going to be an antichrist. He's going to be destroyed. And then after he's destroyed, there's going to be this millennial reign. And we're going to be in communion because we will be glorified. And so this looks like he might be saying, if you look at this first part, that there, he might be a post-trib rapture guy. Okay, and so that a lot of people will quote this that way. And if that's all he said, maybe, he may be. But if he quoted the rapture, talked about the rapture somewhere else and said it's pre-trib, then that's not what he's talking about here. And so that's why we got to look at everything, put everything together. You know, most of us know that if I quote one scripture, I can quote it out of context. And it sounds like Peter or Paul or somebody is really saying something else. But you got to take the whole scriptures together. When you're studying the church fathers, you got to take everything together. So if we know they are all premillennial and that there's a literal seven year tribulation period that happens right before the second coming, and the second coming is basically what starts the millennial reign give or take a year or something, but that's basically how it works. And there's going to be a rapture and a resurrection. And, you know, that's the basic outline of things. Then when someone quotes it and, and it sounds like they're saying something else, then, you know, they're not. So here's a quote down here of him talking about a pre-trib rapture. And I want to show you this. He says this in Against Heresies 529, when at the end, end of what? He's talking about prophecy in general, so you don't know if he's talking about the tribulation period or whatever. But at the end, time, some time in there, the church will suddenly be caught up from this. So the, this, if you went back and, and read the whole chapter, he's talking about all the bad things that happen during the time of the, the tribulation period, the birth pangs right before, all of that stuff before the millennial reign. So sometime the church will suddenly be caught up. So that's the rapture, okay? And notice what he said. Then it is said, quote, and he quotes a scripture that says, there will be a tribulation such as not been since the beginning, nor ever will be, or nor will be. So if you put this in context, there's all the bad things that happen, birth pangs uh, and tribulation period all before the second coming and sometime in that midst the church gets raptured and then he gets a little more specific and says the rapture occurs and then after the rapture of the church there will be that time of tribulation which has not been since the beginning of time now some people will say well you know i believe that too and they're going to say they're mid-trib so this is obviously there's no way he can be post-trib right so that's why when you back up to this one and you see, well, there's going to be a resurrection. He's saying there's going to be a resurrection at the second coming is what it sounds like. We're either not interpreting it correctly or he's thinking there's two resurrections, a rapture resurrection and then one for the uh, tribulation saints that are martyred. And that very well could be, but I don't know if he's saying that or not. But when he talks about this here, he's definitely not talking about us being rapture resurrected at the end time because we happen before the tribulation period so there's no way this guy is a post-trib person okay so you could argue that he's either pre-trib or he's mid-trib if you want to say that tribulation that's not been since the beginning is actually the second half of that three and a half years so that's why you're going to have to go through and we'll look at this later when they say tribulation period, what do they mean? I know people that say, I'm talking about the, the second half only. And I know other people that say, I'm talking about that whole, you know, seven year period. There's a handful of friends of mine that talk about the tribulation being the birth pangs and the seven year period. So we're in the time of the birth pangs now. And we'll show you that later, according to what they're saying. Some of us think that way anyway. Not the tribulation period. Tribulation period has not started yet. We're in the time right before the tribulation period, if I understand scriptures correctly.
But it's interesting here. So if we can go a little bit later and prove that when he says tribulation, he's talking about the seven year period, then this is only one thing. And that's a post or excuse me, a pre trib rapture. Now, if this is the only quote among the church fathers throughout the whole thing, that'd be very iffy. But if they all consistently talk about the tribulation period being a seven year period, and the rapture of the church happening before that tribulation period, that's pre-trib. So that's, I mean, the best you could possibly do is squint at this and say, well, if the wording was kind of like this, then he's mid-trib at the best. There's no way he's post. But we will go on here a little bit later and look at rapture stuff, and we will see how everybody's pre-trib back then. And it, that's what amazes me when they talk about you know, this was invented by Darby in the 1700s. Well, it was made popular by Darby in the 1700s, and not that many people believed or taught about the rapture in general before then, but there actually were quite a few. I, we've got lists of a lot of people, 15, 16, and 1700s that believed in a rapture. Some of them called it a rapture and a parzo, a, a catching away, different things like that. But anyway, so at this point, all we know is that there's going to be a seven-year period. There's an Antichrist and then a second coming where the Antichrist is destroyed. And then a millennial reign. And somewhere along in here, most likely pre-trib, either pre or mid, uh, there's going to be a rapture of the church. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. So we'll come back and we'll begin to see these things more specifically. And we'll notice it's definitely pre. So anyway... So that's what, again, we're just looking at Irenaeus on premillennialism. He's definitely a premillennialist. He's definitely a pre-trib rapture person. Okay. Now going on to the next one. Uh, when does the time of the end begin? Remember, because back here he just said that um, when at the end, the time of the end. So sometime in there, there will be stuff. Then there will be a rapture then there will be a tribulation period. So if the time of the end is only the seven-year period, that would make you think this is talking about a mid-trib. If the time of the end that he's talking about is talking about the uh, birth pangs, when everything begins, then we'll see that. We're going to see an interesting quote for that. So at this point, when does the end time begin, according to Irenaeus? And you can disagree with this. It's not a big deal. But we just want to see what he's thinking, okay? So against Heresies 4, this is the previous book, same set of books. He says, Daniel the prophet said, shut up these words and seal the book even to the time of consummation until many learn and knowledge be completed. Now, just to make sure we know we're talking the same one, let me pull that up. Here's Daniel chapter 12. And he's seeing the time of the end. So he's he's already seen everything about the Antichrist and how the Antichrist comes to power and where from. And he's given us all that detail. And then the Antichrist gets destroyed. So then he backs up kind of in chapter 12. We see Michael standing up and then we actually see a rapture resurrection in here. The, the many of those that sleep in the dust of the earth arise. And then he goes on and talks about other stuff. And. Daniel is going to say, okay, wait a minute, back up now. I want some numbers. When does this happen? Is this before or after? He's going to start asking questions. But before he does that, he says, the angel says to Daniel, this, these three verses is what's going to happen in that time period of the Antichrist. There's going to be several things. And then he says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even unto the time of the end whatever the end times is, until many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Now, definitely when the rapture happens pre-trib or even when, you know, the Antichrist signs the covenant and you see 10 nations, at that point, we'll see certain prophecies and you'll know. But you can actually know there's things happening before that. And that's the time of the end. So there's a time of the end there is a seven-year period. There's the last three and a half years of that seven-year period. And then there is the um, second coming. So those are four things. They're not all the same thing. They're specific words that have a specific meaning to these guys. And that's why we want to 
make sure we understand them. We can disagree with them, not a big deal, but let's make sure we understand them first. So there's a time of the end when many run to and fro and knowledge is increased. So when does that start? And so it's before the tribulation period. So let's look at this quote, according to Irenaeus. He says, the prophet Daniel says, shut up the words, seal the book, even into the time of consummation, time of the end, until many learn and knowledge be completed. So when can we throw a date on there or a basic time period? By date, I mean, you know, sometime before the tribulation or middle of the trib or whatever. He says, for at that time, so here's the key. When does the end, the time of the end start? At that time, when, let me just do this here. When the dispersion shall be accomplished. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Um, the children of Israel got taken out of their land, dispersed to Babylon, and then they came back in 536 BC. They continued there. They had wars and stuff, but they continued there as a nation until the Romans dispersed them, right? And so that's the great dispersion or the great diaspora, as it's called. And then at a certain point, they come back. That's 1948. So he could be saying one of two things, and I'm just throwing all this at you so we can see clearly what it is and is not, could be saying when the dispersion is accomplished. So when the Romans finally kick the Jews out of their land and they cease to exist, that's when the end starts. Well, their end for their country at that point, but that's not what we're talking about because that happens, the, the, the temple's destroyed in 70 AD, and they're kicked out after the Bar Kokhba rebellion. That's when the nation of Israel is completely dissolved. They're all dispersed. They're not allowed to come back in that area. And it becomes a Roman province. Jerusalem is renamed, I think it's Aliyah, something like that. Anyway, so that happens 135. Irenaeus now is writing his book against heresies about 170. So this has been 35 or 40 years ago that the Jews were disposed out of their land. So in 35 years, they're gone and they don't come back. And it's been 35 years and they're still gone. So if at that point he's gonna say, well, when the dispersion is accomplished, what, them get being kicked out of their land, it's already done. That was 35 years ago. So that's not what we're talking about. So the dispersion, the prophecy about the dispersion, so they're supposed to be kicked out of their land until the time, and then they come back. So in 1948, when they actually come back, that's when the dispersion is accomplished. The beginning, the whole process, and then it's finished, because now they get to go back home. So this is what he's talking about. At that time, when the dispersion shall be accomplished, and we know that historically now to be 1948, they shall know all these things. Now, this is really interesting, too. Um, that's his comment. That's just his belief in this system. But let me pull this back up again. This says, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So if we put that together, and we're not going to turn to it, but we've talked about this before, in um, Isaiah chapter 29, it talks about when Israel returns for the second time. There's a war. It looks like they're going to be totally destroyed. And then all of a sudden, almost like you wake up out of a bad dream and it's all gone. In a, in a split second, it's all gone. And they have their nation and they're back. And it goes on to say when that happens, that would be 1948, the old ones begin to speak out of the dust of the earth. And that's when we got the very first of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if you pull all that together, if um, Isaiah 29 is talking about 1948 and the Dead Sea Scrolls coming up, and then because of that, we know the calendar, their theology, and we know a lot of stuff that was hidden by the Pharisees back in the first century. A lot of baloney now that we can just get rid of. Uh, we're that much wiser. And to know that stuff, we're going to understand the prophecies and everything else a little bit better. And it starts 
with the first Dead Sea Scroll being discovered, which happened to be the book of Isaiah in 1948. So if you pull that together, the Dead Sea Scrolls in Isaiah 29, this quote from Irenaeus and the quote from Daniel, what we have there is basically saying the time of the end begins when the nation of Israel comes back and the Dead Sea Scrolls are delivered and knowledge is increased and people run back and forth trying to find even more. That's what I, we're all doing. Where can we find more scroll? Then we begin to understand everything better. That's when the time of the end starts. So the time of the end, the focal point is actually the beginning of Israel returning. So we've been in with, and with that in mind, we've been in the time of the end or in the birth pangs, as Jesus calls it, since 1948. It's been about 70 years and it's going to continue for a little while. Then we're going to have a seven year period suddenly, and then we're going to have a millennial reign. So and it's really interesting if you think about that. So if we back up then, and we won't much, but just looking at this, if there's going to be a, we're pre-millennial, a future uh, tribulation or a future millennium, the seven years prior to that is a tribulation period with an antichrist. There's going to be the rapture of the church before the tribulation period. And the time of the end actually begins with the nation of Israel coming back. We have a fairly good picture of all this. The birth pangs began in 48 with the Dead Sea Scrolls and knowledge increasing. Sometime in the future, there's going to be a tribulation period. And right before that happens, there's going to be a rapture of the church. And he hasn't actually said a seven-year tribulation, but we saw further up that that's there. And we're going to see more quotes that way. And then a millennial reign, a second coming. I think that's fascinating. That's plenty. And at this point, if you're just a regular pre-trib rapture guy, you're saying, yeah, and we knew this before, no new information. But again, it's neat to see it's in the scrolls. It's in the New Testament if we're interpreting it right. And then we're flat out being told by the church fathers, that's the way it's interpreted. And several of these guys say, I double checked. I asked John. I asked Peter. My granddad used to eat with Peter and Paul, and we used to have stories. So, really interesting. So, let's continue. Um, more things from Irenaeus. We're not going to look at a whole lot of them at this point, but just a few so we can just kind of let it sink in. The Roman Empire. This is really important. We've talked a lot about that from the scrolls and from the, the, the Bible. The whole concept about the Roman Empire being... Uh, an empire, and it takes over Israel, and then it, it destroys Israel. Israel is dispersed in the 130s, and then it's not until 395 AD that, this, that they split. So they split into east and west, okay? So in Daniel chapter 2, we see the image of the, the metal image, and the Roman Empire are the two legs of iron. So for the great majority of the time, the Roman Empire is a two-piece empire in East and West. And we saw that. We were able to trace it up to the fall of Western Rome in 476. And then it's reconstituted 400 years later by the Pope of Rome. So we're thinking, you might say that doesn't count, but it's all Rome. So it kind of sort of does count, you know. So that goes on until the... the um, 1880s when it's dispersed by Napoleon and then they try to come back again with a, a second Reich and then they're dispersed in World War II and then they try to come back again under Hitler with a third Reich and then they're deposed again. While all that's going on, the Eastern version uh, lasted until 1453 when it kind of split. It was taken over by Muslims and we have the Ottoman Empire continuing that until 1917. So the Roman Empire exists at least until 1917. But when we examine the third piece to it, we see that it's actually still going on, which makes sense because otherwise we should see 10 nations somewhere and they haven't come yet. So anyway, so the Roman Empire is really interesting. So let's look at what he has to say. The Roman Empire will first be divided and then dissolved. 
And again, this he's writing this in 170. So this is like another 150 years almost, 140 years before it actually happens, that the split happens. And then it being dissolved is at least another thousand years or better. And maybe even 1917, 1948 or further. And then he goes on and says, the fourth kingdom seen by Daniel is Rome. And we see that in Daniel because it says it's the ships of Kittim that come. That's the Roman ships. And we know Rome was an empire that controlled Israel in the first century. So that's, a, that's an easy one, the Roman Empire. But to understand that, the Roman Empire in Daniel's vision has ten horns on the head, the, the nondescript beast. So we're getting there. So that's what he says about the Roman Empire. And then the ten nations that are the ten horns on the Roman Empire uh, he says this, and this is from Against Heresies 526. He says, 10 kings will arise from what used to be the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire is divided, and then it's dissolved. And out of what used to be the Roman Empire, 10 kings arise. That's pretty much what we thought, but it's an interesting wording. The Antichrist slays three of the kings, and he is the eighth among them. That's what we've always been taught. That's the the uh, the ten kingdoms. He's the eleventh. He kills, uh, destroys three of the crowns, and there's seven left, and he's the eighth. So that and that's the the group that goes after Babylon and destroys it. So the kings will destroy Babylon. Then give the Babylonian kingdom to the beast and then put the believers to flight. Again, if there's a pre-trib rapture, it's not us. Just like it's not my parents and grandparents because they've passed on. It's the people alive at that time, but we're all believers. You're either a believer or not. It doesn't matter when you're living. But the believers that he can persecute, he will put them to flight. And of course, we, he's probably referring to Matthew 24, where Jesus says that if you are in Jerusalem, you're probably Jewish if you are, and you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, flee. Those are believers, you know, and they're going to flee or get killed. And then he goes on and says, after that, so after the, the so this would be the middle of the tribulation period. Because the Antichrist has risen, the ten nations have come. He's actually destroyed the Roman, or not the Roman Empire, the Babylonian kingdom, and then started a persecution. So he's probably got the image in the temple and all that stuff. So we're in the second half of the tribulation at that point. After that, they will be destroyed by the coming of the Lord. And you can see that pattern in 2 Thessalonians 2. Daniel's horns, so when Daniel sees the, the image of the beast that's got the ten horns, that's the exact same as the ten toes. So Daniel's, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar has in Daniel chapter 2 is exactly the same as the vision Daniel has in chapter 7. So the ten horns are the ten toes. So that's pretty straightforward. That's what we've all known. Now there are cults today and aberrant groups that teach all sorts of weird things. And then it, it kind of filters in. People will say, well, I heard one person say that the winged lion is, is uh, Britain and the eagle is United States and the big bear is Russia. Well, those are the symbols of those nations right now, but that's not what we're talking about. It very clearly says it's Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And some of the people will say, well, yeah, it was back then, but it's a dual fulfillment prophecy. It really means this. Well, maybe. We'll see. It definitely means the first one. I don't see it being dual fulfillment, but okay, so what is Russia and the United States and Great Britain and these guys doing? So far, not much, you know, but we'll see. Uh, so the ten horns are the same as the ten toes. The toes being partly of iron and partly in clay means that some kings will be active and strong while others are weak and inactive. The kings will not agree with each other. So it's going to be very democratic. And it's probably going to be voting five to five and they can't do much because it's just really not able to do. So that's the basic outline of these. Let's look at uh, 
the abomination of desolation. We know that as the Antichrist putting a uh, image in the temple. Irenaeus says this, in 2 Thessalonians, the falling away is an apostasy and the literal, the literal, uh, there will be a literal rebuilt temple. So understand that this word apostasy is what we translate it as. And some people think that's an apostasy from the faith, some big movement that becomes, most people now would say, I'm not Christian. Um, or it could mean the rapture, you know, and that's debated. He's using the same word too. So we're not sure exactly what he means, but just like Paul says, an apostasy comes first and then the son of perdition. So he's just actually quoting Second Thessalonians. So that falling away is an apostasy, the rapture and or, you know, an apostasy. Probably an apostasy, but we don't know for sure. And there will be a literal rebuilt temple. So there isn't one yet. So, so far, the, the Israelites have come back. The Jews have come back in 1948. In 1967, they took the Temple Mount, but because of politics, have not rebuilt a temple. And that kind of comes and goes, and eventually it will, you know, come to fruition. People ask, ask me a lot, is that before the rapture? Will we actually see that? Don't know. It just happens sometimes. It's definitely built up and running with animal sacrifices in the tribulation because the antichrist comes in and stops the sacrifices so they've got to be restarted before they can be stopped so that part is sure but how long it's been going on i don't know the the jews have uh, a tradition of starting practice sacrifices training the temple the temple priests and things like that before things get started then there will be a blessing laying a, a cornerstone on the temple, and then they'll begin construction sometime. But most people don't realize this, but in 19, no, wait, two, 2016, not, not too long ago, or is it 14? 2014, 2016, um, it's in the prophecy book. But anyway, uh, they started practice sacrifices. So now on Passover and, and different things like that, there will be a sacrifice done properly by priests in Israel, but it's not on the Temple Mount and there's no temple. So they will tell you it's a practice sacrifice because it really isn't the real thing because it's not done at the right place with the right things. It's as close as they can do it. So the practice sacrifices are back. He goes on and says, in Matthew, he doesn't give the chapter, so I throw it in there. It's Matthew 24. But in Matthew, where Jesus is talking, and he quotes about the abomination spoken by Daniel. Okay, so that's not Nero or anything. It is the Antichrist sitting in the temple as if he were Christ. And I think this is interesting. A lot of people said, well, that's, that's Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, Jesus is quoting this in the first century, which is about 140, no, about 160, 70, 80, 90, about 190 years after Antiochus Epiphanes. And he's saying, when you see this in the future, it could be 70 AD, like the preterists say, but it can't be before Jesus' time. So he's saying it's, a, it's in the future, and it refers to the Antichrist sitting in the temple as if he were Christ. Now, again, Irenaeus is saying this is future. He's writing this in 170. The temple's been destroyed for over 100 years. There's no way it could happen in his time until the Jews come back and build a temple. Then it could happen. But it's the future Antichrist is his interpretation. The abomination of desolation, that, that whole thing where he sets in the temple, will start in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, it's mid-trib, and it will last for a literal three years and six months. Okay, time, time and a half a time. The little horn, that 11th horn in Daniel's vision, is the Antichrist. So we have a lot there to look at, and, and if you've studied this before, that's pretty much what we all believe uh, as far as Daniel chapter 11 and the Antichrist, the little horns, the, the ten nations, all that kind of stuff. So we're really not learning anything new, but we are seeing the church fathers believing exactly the same.
Now, it's interesting because we'll look at this and later on, the medieval church is going to say, no, we're, we're all millennial. All this stuff was, was done at 70 AD. It's symbolic of something else. Don't worry about it. Why did so many of the early church fathers teach Protestant theology? I mean, how, how did it, you, you'd have to say these guys got really messed up. The guys that studied under Polycarp and occasionally talked to John and, and heard from John. Yep, that's correct. I mean, they could be liars, I suppose, but it's really hard to think. Now, if it's, again, if it's one guy, that's one thing, but we're going to see all these guys time after time after time. There's a lot of them in the early church. Now, later on, third and fourth century, it gets garbled and who knows who's teaching what. I mean, it's just really bad. But in the first two centuries, everybody taught the same thing. So here's the next thing, the Antichrist from the tribe of Dan. And against Heresies 530, he says, the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan. That is why the tribe is not mentioned in the apocalypse. So that's interesting. That's his opinion. I don't know. But it's interesting. We're going to have several people talk about the Antichrist is from the tribe of Dan. And we have one guy that actually explains it. And this would be Hippolytus. He explained explains what his mentor, which is this quote here, what he's meaning. And according to Hippolytus, he's saying it's not that the Antichrist is Jewish and is born from the tribe of Dan. He's a Danite, you know, tra trace his lineage all the way back to Dan. It's not that that is. It's that he's born in the ancient area that used to be the tribe of Dan. So, you know, like Benjamin is right south of the temple. Judah's where the temple's at, or vice versa, I forget. But, you know, if I was born of the tribe of Judah, I'd be there, not up north. And so he's saying that. Now, the tribe of Dan, that area, is right now is northern Israel, a little piece of Lebanon, and a little piece of Syria. We're told that the Antichrist is a king of a nation north of Israel. So if he's the king, a ruler of Syria or Lebanon, then that would fit perfectly with Daniel chapter 11 and with this. Or if he's just born, his great, 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 so many far back grandfather is actually Dan. So... Either way, it's an interesting thing, but we'll, we'll come back to this and see it. And then the last one here, uh, the number 666. So this is interesting. Um, he's writing about a cult, and I think it's that same cult that said they were the 144,000. Um, they also said something about 666 is something. And he's, he's writing to say, you guys are full of it. That's not what it means at all. And he stops and says, well, maybe I better make sure that I say it right. So he writes a letter to Polycarp and says, I'm just wanting to make sure of this because of these nuts, you know. Did John ever tell you exactly how to interpret the prophecy in the apocalypse or, or how he thinks anyway? He got the vision. He may not know. But did John ever talk to you about this? Because the number of the Antichrist's name is equal to 666. So... Did he ever say anything? Because I'm just double checking. Polycarp writes him back and says, why, yes, actually, I had the same question. So I asked John and he began to explain this to me. And so, again, that is a really cool example of John's gone now. Irenaeus wants to double check. He asked Polycarp and Polycarp says, let me tell you the day we were having lunch and I asked him that question. So here's what he said. And he writes back and tells him this. Basically, he says that, uh, you know, in Greek and Hebrew, it's the same character set for the numbers and the letters. We have different ones. So we have A, B, and C that are letters, and we have 1, 2, and 3 that are numbers. Well, in the Greek and the Hebrew language, it's the same character set. So A, B, C would be like 1, 2, 3. So my name is Ken, K-E-N. So K-E-N is also numbers. So if you add those together, my name equals 72. So I'm definitely not the Antichrist, but that's how it would work. So he begins to explain that you take the name in Greek 
not in Hebrew. That surprised me. I would have figured it'd have to be Hebrew. But in Greek, the name will equal 666. And he begins to explain that there's, I think, Ethan, Nero, and like several other words actually equal 666. So there's most do not, but there's a handful of names that equal 666. So point being, he goes on and says, don't even try to figure out the name of the Antichrist in the 666 prophecy until you see the 10 nations arise. So back in his day, you, you can figure this out. Back in his day, this is 170. Could you figure out the name of the Antichrist back in 170? No. Could you figure it out like I when, when I was saved and talking about this with my parents back in the 1980s? Could we figure that out? No. There's no he wasn't even alive back then. No way he could be back then. Uh, so right now, same thing. It's like the Antichrist might be ready to do something in the next couple of months. Maybe he's not even born yet. Well, how would we know? Well, first, there's a Roman Empire and it splits in half. Okay, that was 395. We're, we're good. Then it continues and it finally fizzles out. We're trying to figure out if, if, if it fizzled out in 1917, 1948, or is it still here? And there's some other prophecies actually to help us pinpoint that. But when it finally fizzles out, that head, you know, that's resurrected finally dies again and it's dissolved permanently, then the 10 nations arise out of it. And so we'll be able to figure out by looking at that 10, 10 nations. So right now, what we need to be doing is looking at a coalition of nations, 10. So right now, the European common market is not 10. United States has 50 states. Um, is there anybody that has 10 something? Well, not really. Not at the moment. Not that I know of, unless it's just recently happened. But that's what we want to look for. And there might be several places that have 10. But is there 10 nations out of what used to be the Roman Empire? And make sure you look at the Roman Empire properly. It's not just West, but it's also Byzantium and possibly another place depending on how you look at the prophecies. So we need to examine all that. But then there should be these 10 nations, and an 11th nation comes in and destroys three of those and takes over the seven. And the leader of that nation, his name should equal 666. So if you see that, you've identified the Antichrist. Done. So, but there's no way to even bother with it until you see those 10 nations. So that's pretty interesting. So here's a summary of, I think I got it, I thought I had a chart for him. There we go. A summary of what Irenaeus says about the end times. Number one, the church apostatizes. The Antichrist is born in the area of Dan. Uh, at the start of that seven-year period, there's going to be the rapture of the church, right at it or before it, somewhere in there. Uh, the building of the Jerusalem temple, again, at, at the beginning or somewhere before. And then the ten nations come together under the Antichrist and they destroy Mystery Babylon. So we want to find out who Mystery Babylon is. And I think there's ways we can do that too. But it should all come together. But anyway, in the middle of the seven-year period, there's the Antichrist setting up an abomination of desolation, as spoken by Daniel and the Messiah. And then the 10 nations after that begin to persecute believers, a serious persecution. Then there's a second coming and an establishment of a millennial reign. That's a literal reign and the building of a millennial temple. So that's pretty interesting. So that's really not much. Um, that's pretty much what we've always said and always talked about. But so far we've seen Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Papias, and somebody else I think we looked at, oh, Epistle of Barnabas, uh, basically saying the same thing. So the time of the end started in 1948 with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the old ones speaking out of the dust of the earth. There's been a lot of little prophecies fulfilled in the last 70 some years, including the start of practice sacrifices and things like that. There will be a pre-trib rapture of the church um, a rebuilt Jerusalem temple, and then a tribulation period and a second coming. So we'll stop there.
But I want to continue with this because in, this is interesting because we've got several people in the first century, Justin Martyr, and then all this stuff we just looked at with Irenaeus. And then we've got Ephraim's The End Times. He wrote in, this is just little pieces from Irenaeus's five volume book, little chapters or, you know, little pieces. But Ephraim actually writes a whole book on the end times. And then Hippolytus writes two, one called The Antichrist, all about his stuff, and the other one called On the End of the World, which actually should be translated, now that we understand the scrolls better, The End of the Age. So pretty interesting. And that's all this book has, because that's the basically all of it put together. It would take us a good amount of time. Here is the chapters in Ephraim's book. Um, all of these. And then uh, Hippolytus' book on the Antichrist. We've got all of those chapters. All of those chapters. 65 chapters on prophecy. And then Hippolytus' work on the end times. We have all of these. So it's another 41 chapters. All sorts of different things. Oh, now that I think about it, this is where I was looking for a prophecy the other day. I think it's in here. Anyway, so we'll stop there for tonight. So again, you didn't really learn anything new, but you learned that the scrolls, Protestant theology, and the early church fathers all teach the same thing, at least in the big pieces.